and you are welcome to Lifelines. I'm Ricky, I'm one of the Lifelines and we also have Priscilla on the channel. She is also another Lifeline and this channel is just to talk about our different medical journeys. I am a graduated nursing student and I am going into the field of medicine to be an MD or DO. Um, and Priscilla is graduated as well and she is currently a working nurse and she's looking at master's programs and just giving you overall updates as a new grad nurse. So make sure that you're liking, commenting, subscribing and all that jazz so that we can keep posting more content for you guys. But as you can see in the title, I'm here to talk about how to be an individual who goes into medicine, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a nursing major, whether you're a dance student, even if you're a nurse practitioner or PA, either way, this is how you can get into medicine, all right? And it's so funny because anytime I tell someone, oh yeah, I'm a nurse, but I am going into medicine, I always get like a weird look or like, why don't you just become a nurse practitioner? If you wanna know why, check out our other videos. I talk about why I made this transition and all that jazz. So I'm just going to get into all of the details that you need so that you can make this transition. Sorry guys, I'm gonna be looking down sometimes just cause I don't wanna forget a single thing that I have for you guys. All right, so first, before you even think about making this transition, think about why do you wanna do it. Think about why would you want to um, immerse yourself in a lot of schooling, in a lot of hard work, in a lot of dedication. What is the why behind you wanting to be um, an individual who goes into medicine, all right? Um, I really evaluate those things and just take one shadowing opportunity or even if you already had that aha moment, really think about how you would make a game plan. And in this game plan, you wanna talk about how long do you wanna do, do your prerequisites for and how much time, money, resources do you have to be able to do these prerequisites. So um, if you are out of undergrad like me, um, one option that I explored was a formal post-baccalaureate program. And there's two types of post-baccalaureate programs that can either be um, career changer or academic enhancement because I've never taken any of the pre-med um, courses just like you, or if you only took one or two, you would still be considered a career changer. So I looked at career changer programs all over um, the area and I looked at them by different qualifications. I can shoot out another video about what to look for in a post-bac video if you're looking at that, but you would just look at post-bac programs that are career changer programs, and those programs are specifically designed to have a curriculum that you would need. The other option is also a DIY um, program, and that's basically a do-it-yourself. So basically you enroll yourself into either a university or a community college and you take the courses that you need. When doing this route, I never personally really looked into the route. I maybe looked at it, but I know myself, I need structure, I need a lot of resources um, to be able to push this whole mission going. I um, recommend for if you do the DIY program to go in as a degree seeking student. And then once you finish all your prerequisites, you leave. That's what a lot of people who are doing DIYs have told me that their biggest regret is that if you enter in as a non-degree seeking student, you won't be able to have financial aid, FAFSA and things like that. So you would have to um, pay out of pocket, which a lot of these programs you do have to do. Um, but with degree seeking, you are able to have those benefits and other benefits such as like registering for classes early and things like that. So DIY, you're gonna go for degree seeking after you finish those prereq courses, then you're gonna vamos. And then if you're in a formal post back program, you're just gonna finish that formal post back program that can either be in a one year program or a two year program. I personally chose the two year program um, for other reasons which I can give in another video. All right. So now we're going to still go into classes, but these classes are not necessarily mandatory to get into med school. They're just really recommended. Um, so some of them is psych and sociology. 
psychology and sociology. As a nursing major, I already took those. Um, both of them, I went to like higher level ones. So I'm all good with that, but I will have to study them again. Um, and I'll explain why in a minute. And another course is calculus. That's a recommended course. It's some medical schools require it, some don't. As I'm still trying to put my list together, I haven't seen a medical school that has required me to take it and me and math don't click. <laughs> so I'm strongly trying to avoid anything math-like. So calculus is out for me, honestly. And then you have your upper sciences, like your micro, your genetics, your, um, there's discussion in medical ethics, like anything with a bio in front of it, honestly, um, is a type of upper science. And this is really helpful because it shows how strong you are in the sciences. It can also boost up your science GPA, which medical schools are um, also looking at. Um, when I was interviewing for schools, the school I'm currently at now, when I was talking to the advisor, she's the one who actually told me that they're not just looking at your cumulative, they're really focusing on that BCPM. Um, it's a type of GPA, or it's also called a science GPA. So the better you do in those science classes, the better your GPA is, which is really, really, really important, all right? So just be sure to be doing well in all those classes. Um, I'm not going to say a gold GPA because everyone's story is different and um, it's different for all the schools, but my biggest thing is just to make sure you have an upward trend. Like you're doing like this way and then you're going to keep going up, keep going up, keep going up. And you can track all of this and see all of your like trends on this app called Mapped. Um, Dr. Gray, I love the app. It's wonderful. It shows you like all of the different trends with your GPA and how it will look. And it also calculates so you see what it the schools will see before you apply for medical school. All right. So now I'm going to just go into the exam that you have to take. So after I take all these courses, Ricky, what do I do? You have to take the MCAT. <laughs> What's that slogan? The MCAT? Like MCAT is hard and the MCAT is hard something like that it's some funny slogan but yeah the MCAT is hard that's just point blank period um, a lot of people struggle with it the lowest you can get is a 472 and the highest score you can get is a 528 now the goal is to get a 500 that's what I've been told that's what I've heard if you want to argue argue with your mama <laughs> But I've heard a lot of success stories off of a 500, but to be really competitive, of course, you wanna get the closest thing to a 528. So you just wanna have a lot of content review with that, really do well in these classes that you have to take so that that knowledge can transfer over. A lot of preparation, people prep for like six months, seven months, eight months, like it takes a lot of preparation. I won't be taking six months personally to study for the MCAT, um, but it does take a lot of hard work for that. All right, so we talked about the books, we talked about the, the test you gotta take. Now let's look outside of the scope of school. What else do I have to do to get into medical school, become a physician, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. So you also have to look into your clinical experience. So of course, as a nurse, you probably have hours and hours and hours and hours of clinical experience, which is great. It can be paid, it can be unpaid. I don't, um, from what I've like seen in research colleges, I mean, univer medical schools don't look at you differently for having paid or unpaid. It just needs to be there. So clinical experience, so patient contact, all right? And then you need research experience. I feel like this is also school dependent. Some schools are really research heavy, some are not. Um, and depending on who you are and things like that, um, it depends on if you really want to. There is clinical research, bench research, and you just have to look for these opportunities. I recently got a research opportunity. I'm super excited. And it's even in um, a specialty that I am super excited in, which is pediatrics. So yeah, I'm really excited to start that. And it's clinical based. I think I would personally not like bench research. So I was like running clear from it. But my advisors in my post back program, another plus of a post back was able to direct me to an opportunity and it's going to start soon. So I'm excited about that. 
So research, whether it's clinical based or um, bench, that's cool too. Then we have volunteering. Um, volunteering, I would say like, that's kind of like a, a, I have a seesaw decision about that. Like sometimes I think you need, sometimes you don't. Um, I would personally get into research because it works on your empathy. I mean, personally get into volunteering because it works on your empathy. It shows that you're not just worried about checking off boxes. Like you have initiatives that you're truly passionate about and that you truly love. And all of these things don't have to start off at 10 hours a week. You could do two hours a week, one hour a week. By the time you know, by the end of the year, you got a whole junk full. So it just depends on um, your schedule, your preference. That's why I really talked about in step one, like what are your resources? What is the time that you can allocate? And you don't have to do all of this at once. Personally, for me, I was in a volunteering scholarship, so I have over 1,200 hours of volunteering. So now I will only be working on like very small scale events or like projects that um, won't take a lot of time because I personally already have a lot of that under my belt. Um, I still work in volunteering just because it's something that I love to do and want to do. So that's your choice. And then lastly, um, we have shadowing. Now, if you're a nurse, you need shadowing. Let me say this again. If you're a nurse, you need shadowing. And this is based on the advice I've gotten from several individuals. Um, I understand as a nurse, you're in the hospital or outpatient, wherever you are, you're interacting with physicians all the time. You're talking to them, you're getting, you know what they do, right? But you also need to really prove to yourself and to the admissions committees that you understand what they do and that you have taken yourself out of that I'm a nurse role and you solely dedicated a certain amount of hours to being able to see what a future career could be. That's all I'm gonna leave it at. I started shadowing in nursing school, actually. I started shadowing physicians in my like last semester because I had a little bit more free time. And honestly, it was way different than from clinical. Like in clinical, when I realized this is a path I wanted to get into, I would try and like approach doctors, try and build up the confidence to be like, hey doc, what are you doing? Or can I follow you around? And I feel like between putting myself um, out of that nursing student position and saying, okay, I'm with the physician, I'm helping him out today. It was a totally different experience from what I felt like being there, you know that you have a different position, you know you have a different purpose. So you definitely need the shadowing hours. Now, the amount for all of these things, it varies. And I think you need to do it based on the time that you have. Remember to be competitive, um, there's many individuals who are stacking up on these hours. So I feel like based on what you can do, um, just stack up on it as much as you can. If you can shadow a physician for maybe two hours every week for a whole year, boom, that's a lot of hours. That's even a recommendation from them. And you're able to be exposed to so many different things. I shadowed an OBGYN so far. I've shadowed a um, cardiothoracic surgeon so far. Um, I've shadowed an intensivist so far. I've shadowed an internal medicine doc so far. And um, this was not even like, I'm. this is separate from my clinicals that I had. Like this is directly like, hey, can I shadow you for a day? And it's been amazing experiences. I know with COVID and everything, it's really hard, but you just have to look for them. Like I have obviously connections to the hospital because I've worked in one and I work in one now. So I just have these emails and build relationships. And so I just reach out to people. Like if you guys knew how many emails I've sent and called, I think I when I first was shadowing, I bothered Priscilla so much. I was texting her each one that I was sending just because I wanted someone to be able to keep me accountable. So basically that's all the info I have for you guys now. If you want to become a physician, if you want to go into dentistry, podiatric medicine, those also have similar tracks to them. Um, but this is how you go from nursing to medicine. So without further ado guys, please be sure to like, comment and subscribe and follow us on Instagram. We love you guys. Thank you so much for being a part of our journey. Please feel free to email us. Um, we have a lot of you guys emailing us and we're getting back to you guys with feedback and help with your post back decisions and things like that. Uh, please be sure to support us and we love you guys. Bye.